you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I beg to move that this House has considered the Health and Social Care Committee's report on cancer services and the Government's response to it. Now, I'm, of course, very grateful to the Liaison Committee for selecting this topic for debate in the Chamber today. We know that one in two people in the UK will develop cancer at some point in their lives. So it's no exaggeration to say this is an effect issue that affects everyone in the House, indeed everyone in the country, in one way or another. It's touched my life to the, to the worst many times, and uh, I'll touch on that later. It's why the Health and Social Care Select Committee produced a report on cancer services earlier this year. And I pay tribute to my predecessor in that role, my right honourable friend, the member for South West Surrey, for his leadership in producing that work. And that statistic, that awful statistic, is why I have made cancer a priority uh, for myself as the new chair of the committee. Now, our report found that great strides had indeed been made in improving survival from cancer. Thanks to the tireless work of our scientists, our researchers, our doctors, our nurses, and others, including ministers, over many, many years. Um, more than half of people diagnosed with cancer now live for five years or more, compared to only one in three people 50 years ago. But we also heard, Madam Deputy Speaker, that cancer survival in England, and indeed the rest of the UK, continues to lag behind comparable countries around the world. The International Cancer Benchmarking Partnership explained that just under 60% of people diagnosed with bowel cancer in England, for instance, will live for five years or more. That, can figure, that figure compares to 66.8% of people diagnosed with bowel cancer in Canada and almost 71% in Australia. The pattern is seen in many other cancer types, including lung cancer, which of course took our great friend James Brokenshire uh, last year. Pancreatic cancer, which took my own father, who was diagnosed in September of 2019 and was dead three days after the general election that December. And ovarian cancer, which has also touched my, my family and so many people. We had target ovarian cancer in this house uh, earlier this month. Uh, no, last month, sorry. Um, and my good friend, the, the member for Washington North, I believe, um, who chairs that all-party group, led their reception downstairs in the Churchill Room, and they launched their Pathfinder study, Faster, Further and Fairer. And that notes that 4,000 women a year still lose their lives to ovarian cancer, and um, I would highly recommend its excellent work, its excellent report to members. Now, we know that one of the biggest reasons for this gap in survival that I quoted some comparative figures there, is that the NHS does tend to diagnose fewer cancers at an early stage when it is, of course, much more treatable. Um, di early diagnosis is cancer's magic key, uh, as has been said so many times from, from these benches. Now, NHS England has set a target to diagnose 75% of cancers at an early stage by 2028 compared to around 54% today. And achieving this, uh, we, we say, would make a huge difference to outcomes. I agreed that target when I was the Cancer Minister a few years ago, and I, and I firmly believe that it's the right target to give more people the best possible chance of surviving their cancer. But I think we need to do mu be much more ambitious and get upstream of many cancers, and, and I'll return to that. Last month, uh, the excellent Dame Kelly Palmer, who's the National Cancer Director, uh, also works at Marsden, told us in a special topical session of the Select Committee that she remained, quote, cautiously optimistic that the 75% target would be met and told us about some great progress being made on programmes like targeted lung screening. We've all heard about the supermarket checks which is diagnosing lots of early stage lung cancers in the pilot studies and, um, and, and has great promise actually. But Dame Kelly's optimism 
I have to say, was not entirely shared by many experts who gave evidence to our inquiry into cancer services. John Butler, uh, a specialist in ovarian cancer, thought that it was, in his words, extremely unlikely that that 75% target would be reached. And Dr Jeanette Dixon, an oncologist, said the NHS, her words again, were doing very badly against the target. This is a worry. Regrettably, we concluded in our work that the NHS was not on track to meet the 75% target. And I have to say it's a judgment that was shared by the committee's independent panel of experts who evaluated government progress on cancer services. Now, the government responded to us and said that it was premature to say that progress towards this target is off track. But the National Audit Office found that 56% of patients are being diagnosed at stages one or two so far this year, which is the same proportion as when I made the target in 2019. And of course, it's below the level of improvement required to reach that three quarters target of early diagnosis by 2028. And, and Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I don't agree that it can ever be premature to call for more to be done to make progress on early diagnosis when failing to achieve the target could mean so many hundreds of thousands of people missing out on an early cancer diagnosis and of course a better chance of living for longer and surviving their cancer. Now the committee heard extremely powerfully why it's so important to make more and faster progress on diagnosing cancers earlier. In December 2020, Andrea Brady's daughter Jess died from stage four adenocarcinoma at the age of just 27 years old. Before her diagnosis, Jess had been passed from pillar to post, repeatedly consulting with multiple GPs and other clinicians before her mother was finally forced to pay for a private consultation just to get Jess a diagnosis. By that point, tragically, it was too late. Jess passed away in hospital three and a half, three and a half weeks after she was diagnosed. So meeting the target of diagnosing 75% of cancers at an early stage would mean thousands of people being given a better chance of surviving their cancer and thousands fewer families having to suffer such terrible losses. And that's why we called in our report for the then promised 10 year cancer plan to kick start progress on early diagnosis. We called for it to consider more radical proposals on how to diagnose more cancers at an early stage and to include an associated workforce plan to reduce the diagnostic bottlenecks in the system. And there's good work ongoing, and I know the Minister will talk about this later on. New research like the NHS Galeri blood test trial could be potentially transformative. Indeed, last month our colleagues at NHS England would not be drawn on whether there is a need for a new 10-year cancer plan, as previous governments have promised. They seem to imply that the new plan wasn't needed, given the focus of the long-term plan on early diagnosis. Uh, I would contest that. Um, the, the consultation that was done on a new 10-year cancer plan was responded to by the sector, by charities, by Royal Colleges, by by many, many organisations, and it has set many hairs running and great expectation about there being a future cancer plan. So I think we on the committee, and I see other members present in the House, we are concerned about that. And we're not hung up on plans, but in my experience of being a minister, the NHS loves a plan, the NHS needs a plan, and critically, it allows this House to see where we are against a plan. So achieving early diagnosis is not just about what NHS England can do from the centre. It's also about improving public awareness of the many signs and symptoms of cancer across all communities. It's about making sure that GPs have good systems in place for managing patients with possible cancers and are able to refer them on for tests without barriers. It's about the continual improvement of screening programmes and hard work really hard work in local areas to encourage people to come forward and of course this is one of the great promise of the new integrated care systems working with the cancer networks the cancer alliances to to deliver on that system population that system early early diagnosis system prevention 
And it's about focusing research and innovation on developing new ways to detect cancer, especially those which are hard to diagnose and ensuring the NHS is set up to roll out new tests quickly. And I referred to Gallery earlier, and, and I mentioned earlier about upstream cancer. And we're going to be doing a piece of work next year that I, that I, that I loosely call Future Cancer, because it is important, of course, that we, that we diagnose cancers early, and that is the basis of, of the remarks I'm making today. But at the moment, largely what we do is diagnose cancers and then when, when they are symptomatic, and hopefully we catch those symptoms early and then we treat them early, and, and many, many cancers, uh, not all, are preventable when that, when that happens. What I'm interested in, as well as that, is future cancer. So where can we get upstream of this? Where can we use our genomics, the NHS's new genomic strategy? Where can we use biomarkers to get ahead of that? And there are big moral and ethical questions that that poses to us as a society. But this should not be a reason why we don't go there. It should not be a reason why we don't have that ambition. So all of this is about making sure that there is enough staff and machines in the system to do even more tests and give many more people the best possible chance of being diagnosed with cancer at an early stage. Now the 10-year cancer plan should look again to make sure the government is truly pulling out all the stops to, to get to 75% at the early stage by 28. I hope the Minister will confirm the government is still committed to doing this work. And of course, early diagnosis means little if there's not sufficient capacity to provide people with the right treatments at the right time. Unfortunately, the latest data suggests that there has been a decline in the NHS's ability to provide this treatment. Whilst the vast majority of people do still receive timely treatment following a cancer diagnosis, in September, nearly 10% of people waited more than a month for their first treatment following a diagnosis, compared to less than 5% in 2019. So that's more than 2,400 people having to wait more than an entire month to begin their cancer treatment, more than double the number waiting that long two years prior. As the former cancer director, Professor Samite Richards, uh, a, a giant in this, in this area, often says, when you're waiting for a cancer diagnosis or treatment, it's not the 31 days that really matter, it's the 31 nights. And I know that people around the country will, will understand that. With great pleasure. I, I'm grateful and I, I, I wish to commend the, uh, the uh, Honourable Member for Winchester, the Chair of the Select Committee, for a, an excellent report and for an excellent analysis of the problems and the way forward. But he did refer to the latest uh, cancer waiting times and it's quite timely we're having this debate today because the new cancer stats uh, have been published by NHS England today and they do actually show the position is worsening. Uh, in October of this year, 39.7% of cancer patients waited beyond 62 days for cancer treatment between urgent referral and treatment. So I, I, I think there is an urgency in addressing some of the issues the Chair raises. Indeed, and the reason why we had Dane Kelly and actually Professor Peter Johnson, who's the National Clinical Director for, for, for Cancer, into the Select Committee a couple of weeks ago is because the NHS has set itself a deadline of next spring, which actually was this spring, to get back to the 62-day wait. And, um, you know, I, I, I have everything I have crossed that they can get there, um, but they need to make it happen. And I, you know, I know they are relentlessly focused on that, and the Minister is relentlessly focused on that, um, but we've got to help them get there. So the committee also heard about the challenges facing surgery and radiotherapy services, which is rather timely that the Honourable Gentleman should intervene on me at that point. I suspect he may speak about this later. Professor Pat Price, who he and I are going to meet uh, early in the new year, who's a consultant oncologist at Imperial College in London, told us that radiotherapy services were lacking staff and machines to be able to deliver the best possible care and that services were struggling to deliver the level of activity needed to catch up with the cancer backlog. And uh, I will let the Honourable Gentleman expand on that a bit later on. Professor Mike Griffin, Professor of Surgery at Newcastle University, also highlighted workforce shortages as a significant barrier to effective cancer surgery, but he also told us about the organisation of services. 
Now, because cancer surgery is often co-located within general acute and emergency care, it can be subject to delay because of capacity shortage. And this was a particular problem, of course, during COVID in some places, but not everywhere. In my trust, Hampshire hospitals, um, they did a brilliant job to keep cancer surgery on, on track at all times through, through doing it off-site. And I pay tribute to Alex Whitfield and her team at Hampshire Hospitals for the organisation that they made with Sarum Road uh, Private Hospital in particular to make sure that patients continue to get their cancer treatment. Professor Griffin called for more ring-fenced hubs to be developed so that cancer surgery can continue even when there are severe pressures on acute care. And I hope the Minister may, may refer to that when she, when she winds up. Now, growing the workforce, investing over the long term in machines and IT, reorganising services to create more cancer surgery hubs. These are in the government's gift, which is why we recommended the government should consider these actions in developing the 10 year plan. Now, without a wider focus on removing the barriers to the NHS delivering the best possible cancer treatments, the potential gains of earlier diagnosis may not be realised. And given the number of people presenting with cancer at the moment, which is of course a good thing, and many of them will not have cancer. They will have, they present with suspected, sorry, suspected cancer. Many of them will not turn out to have cancer. But where they do, we need to obviously to move on that, which is why treatment is the other side of the same coin. And of course, just as further progress in early diagnosis will de depend on research and innovation to develop new tests, improving cancer treatments will require new and more advanced techniques to be developed and then implemented into the NHS. We found on the, in the committee report that the UK is a genuine world leader in research, and it is. There are unique aspects to the NHS which make it an effective partner for research organisations. We also heard there are significant barriers to researchers accessing the data they need to quick and equitable patient recruitment to clinical trials and to staff having the time they need to take part in research. Now, the government set out several steps it's taken to improve access to data and improve flexibility for staff wanting to take part in research. This is very welcome. But research by Cancer Research UK has found that the UK's recovery from the pandemic in clinical trials continues to be outpaced by other comparable UK countries. NHS England themselves told us that supporting clinical research into cancer is not their responsibility. So it's clear a wider effort is needed to make sure cancer research taking place in the NHS is well supported and aligned with the priorities for cancer services. Another reason why the plan, I would suggest, is important. Finally, we heard there is significant variation outcome for people diagnosed with cancer, depending in part on the type of cancer they're diagnosed with, but also demographic factors. The government told us it will be addressing these differences through the levelling up white paper, but also through the health disparities white paper by addressing issues like smoking and obesity, which are more prevalent in our more deprived communities. And, and on that, I, I, there's a story in today's press which suggests that Britain has the biggest increase of early onset diabetes in the Western world. This is a huge concern and, and of course I'm not suggesting diabetes is cancer. What I'm suggesting is that we have many suggested actions to reduce obesity around junk food advertising, stuff that follows on from the sugar tax. Um, much of that has still not been implemented. There are rumours abound, there are always rumours abound here, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are rumours abound that the government are seeking to delay junk food advertising restrictions now back until 2025. I hope that is wrong, and I would invite the Minister to respond to that when she winds up, and if not, to take that away. And on that note, somebody who I know possibly shares that view, I give way to my honourable friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way and I 100% agree with his concerns about potential watering down of the much needed obesity, uh, uh, anti-obesity measures. But does he also agree with me that it's important that we, we reflect what the public want? And the public are in agreement 
with banning advertising on, on TV for uh, uh, particular foods that cause obesity. So if we want to keep the public on our side, surely we've got to do their wishes as well. Yeah. And, and I think that is right. I mean, the, 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 pub, it, the public are very, very clear on this, and I get it. There are different views across this house. Um, those who disagree with a lot of the work that I did and, and my humble friend did in government um, to push some of those um, measures to, to prevent obesity, I could agree with them, but then we'd both be wrong. Um, at the end of the day, obesity is a driver of diabetes, as I just referred to. Obesity is a driver of cancers of certain cancers and we must take that seriously and the select committee next year will be doing a huge piece of work on prevention and we will be returning to this um, and, I, and I hope ministers are, are aware of that. So the recognition of the importance of health in the levelling up white paper is very welcome but without specific actions to address health disparities this agenda will be at risk so it's vital that the government takes up the prevention agenda again to stop more people from developing cancer in the first place and I hope the minister will have some good news for us on that front and I, I would... I would recommend that she returns to the Prevention Green paper that we published back in uh, 2019, which contains lots of, uh, lots of helpful ideas in that respect. Uh, good way. I thank the Honourable Member for, for giving way. And, and on that point about health disparities and, and levelling up, I wanted to just draw attention to the Royal Devon University Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust, which serves uh, the Tiverton and Honiton constituency. Um, I mean, the, the staff who work there do an absolutely fantastic job of, of cancer diagnosis, but uh, given that the, the target for seeing a cancer specialist within two weeks is 93%, it's, uh, it's really tragic that um, only fewer than 60% of, of people uh, who are served by that trust uh, see a cancer specialist um, after or within two weeks of a referral. So um, does he uh, agree with me that we really do need to uh, level across as well as level up and think about um, health disparities across the country? Yes, of course. I mean, you know, this, this, shouldn't, this shouldn't be a... I hate the term. This shouldn't be a postcode lottery. But what I would say is that, you know, we do have integrated care systems, we do have cancer networks, and, you know good, strong, experienced MPs should be driving those local health economies to make sure that they level themselves up and make use of what is there in the system to make sure that they deliver as good for their population as happens in other parts of the country. And um, you know, I think there could be a lot more sharing among members in this House of how we use that ability as members of Parliament to drive our systems. Uh, I do it in my area, and I'm sure, he, I'm sure he does it in his, so thank him for his intervention. So there are issues of variation affecting cancer, specifically like proper screening uptake among certain groups, lower referral rates for some cancers in certain areas, and higher rates of less survivable cancers among more deprived groups. Um, we call for NHS England and the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities to produce an action plan for addressing disparities in cancer and for the the much-talked 10-year cancer plan to include a specific action uh, schedule for, for, for rarer and less survivable cancers. This remains for, for us a vital aspect of improving cancer services and we hope that the long-term cancer plan, should one arrive, makes this part of its work. Last month NHS England made it clear to us they were focusing on delivering the NHS long-term plan for cancer and in many ways this emphasis on delivery is of course welcome. Uh, and the programmes being implemented as part of that work are positive and I've covered some of them today. But recent research from the International Cancer Benefit Market Partnership has shown that national cancer plans are worth far more than just the paper they're written on. The ICBP found that countries who've made the biggest improvements in cancer since 1995 are those who have ambitious, detailed and costed plans for improving cancer services that are open to scrutiny by those whose job it is to do that, i.e. us. Denmark and England used to be at the bottom of the league table for cancer, but thanks to consistent national cancer plans with associated long-term investment, the Danes have made rapid improvements and they now leave us lagging a bit behind. So in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Health and Social Care Committee's report on cancer services, the 12th report of session, found that there are many areas where the government and the NHS are doing really good work and using 
the unique benefits of our National Health Service. But there are other areas, too many areas, where we can go further and faster to improve cancer services and outcomes. And I hope the government will confirm it intends to do so through the promised 10-year cancer plan when we hear from the Minister later on. Thank you.